The following program does not offer personal medical advice. Please consult your doctor before using any treatment or product we cover. Welcome to Go to Health Radio with your host, Jonathan Marks. We provide a welcoming environment where experts educate you on important health topics, answer your questions, and provide information from which you can benefit in consultation with your doctor. And now, here is Jonathan Marks. Hey, everybody. This is Jonathan Marks back with a new episode. We're talking today about a fascinating subject, and I'm so glad I found our speaker. The subject for today is called Satisfying Intimacy and Sex for the Long Haul. And um, I, we wanted to talk about this because our guest, Jenny Schuyler, is a certified sex therapist, um, but also we've been through COVID and has COVID changed intimacy or brought new challenges? And I wanted to bring Jenny on. So let me tell you a little bit about her. We're talking about um, certified sex therapist, Dr. Jenny Schuyler, PhD. She's also a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified sex therapist. She's an ASEC sex certified sex therapist, board certified sexologist, and a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's been the director of the Intimacy Institute for Sex and Relationship Therapy for over 12 years. You can visit the intimacyinstitute.org. She also holds a doctorate in clinical sexology and a master of education in counseling psychology and marriage and family therapy. And in addition, Dr. Jenny offers sexological wisdom and advice as the in-house resident expert at Adam and Eve, which is America's largest sex toy company. And they are sponsoring today's show. You can visit them at adameve.com. So Jenny, how are you today? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. I'm well. Good. Pleasure so, to be here. Good. So tell us about the Intimacy Institute. What kind of work do you do with people and, and a little bit about how you do that? Sure. So the Intimacy Institute is my business name for my private practice. I co-run it with my husband, who is also a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of a cool, unique angle because we're both a married couple and sex and relationship therapists. So we have a lot of wisdom from <laughs> the trenches, if you will, in terms of our marriage, but also professionally. And we help, you know, I would say half our practice is helping couples and the other half is individuals. So he works individually with men on masculinity, male sexual function, like premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, um, out of control sexual behavior, and then couples. I also work with couples. I work with a lot of couples healing from an affair, a lot of couples with desire discrepancy, a lot of couples trying to make long-term monogamy work some couples trying to make polyamory work. And then I have a lot of women with anorgasmia, which is a struggle to orgasm either alone or with a partner. I have women with painful intercourse. Um, I have women who feel like their uh, arousal and or desire have gone missing or feel elusive. Mm -hmm. So all of those are sort of the general lay of the land of the clinical issues that we typically navigate. We get some other outliers like unconventional turn-ons and fun things like that too. But I would mm -hmm. say that the chunk of clients that typically come in are those. And do you see people um, only in the office or do you also see people virtually? All virtual right now. So we used to be on the front range and we moved to the mountains mid COVID and we're in Colorado. So we, we, we love the Colorado mountains. So we moved and we're completely telehealth, which we have found has been really useful for people. They sometimes do a car session or they don't have to find parking and they don't have to come to our office. It's, it's very efficient for people with, the, with telehealth. And we also offer a lot of video courses for couples and individuals. So there's a lot of offerings that the Institute offers. Great. And so how was the Intimacy Institute born? How did you come up with this concept? Oh, that's a good story. Well, I had to do a postdoc. I shouldn't say I had to. I, I had the privilege of doing this fantastic postdoc. Mm -hmm. um, it was a sexual health scholars program at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. And it was a unique program on building leadership and sexual health, and it was just fantastic. And what happened was there, one of the courses there was to build out a business plan, either mm. a real one or just, you know, as an exercise. And I thought, I'm building out a real one. And so I got a lot of good feedback from fabulous mentors, 
all in the field of sexual health from all angles of sexual health. There's people who work in research, people who work in education, people who work in therapy. I mean, just all over the board. And I did a whole PowerPoint presentation on what I wanted to do in terms of how I wanted to help the public. And so that's sort of how the name and the concept of the Intimacy Institute got born, mm-hmm. um, or I should say it was birthed. Mm-hmm. And after that, I moved back to Colorado and launched it. Cool. And and when did you meet your husband in this in this process? I met him a few years after I launched it. Okay. So I was I was already up and running, and he was a student going to um, school in therapy, in marriage and family therapy, and we bonded and decided, you know, this would be a good marriage professionally and personally. Great. Good for you. Congratulations. And so, so do you have plans? I mean, how is, how has the Intimacy Institute changed, you know, since COVID and what plans do you have going forward? Yeah. Well, it used to be all in person before COVID and we used to have in-person retreats, for instance. And with COVID, we decided to put all of our retreat material on a video course because Hmm. we didn't know where COVID was going. We didn't know people's ability to meet face to face. So all of that went onto a video course. All of our work went telehealth. And I think the next phase is offering a lot of master courses, um, mm. either through our website or through a bigger bigger membership portal. Mm-hmm. So we're going to really just launch a lot more content for people virtually Wonderful. coming up pretty soon. Good. And I'm just curious, have you found that COVID has, and you know, either the isolation or the hybrid work work world, has that affected intimacy in some way? Completely. We were slammed. COVID was our busiest time. And when it Mm. slowed down, when COVID started to sort of peter out a little bit, we were able to take a a deeper breath, if you will. Um, It was interesting. The second COVID hit and people were locked down and in quarantine and isolated together, a lot of couples realized they didn't like each other. You know, a Mm. lot of my couples where one person traveled a bunch or they just lived very busy work lives outside of the home and saw each other for scarce moments at breakfast or after dinner. You know, that worked well for couples who, you know, needed a lot more space in their relationship. Mm -hmm. And then they suddenly don't have any space. Mm -hmm. And it's in the space that we get to yearn for each other. It's in the space that the other person is mysterious. And it's in the space that we have our autonomy and individuality. So without all that, people felt smothered. Mm. And that really rocked their world, both emotionally and that <laughs> very much so sexually. Mm-hmm. So how, let's talk about some, how, how do you maintain, I mean, this is the topic of the show. How do you maintain satisfying intimacy and sex for the long haul? Start talking to me about some of these secrets and how you maintain this individuality and separation, but still the intimacy. Yeah, for sure. What my husband and I developed is what we call a roadmap to intimacy. And it starts with this concept of having strong emotional foundation. And that's sort of your foundation, but also your elevator. And then the idea is you have the stair-step model, right? So you have strong emotional intimacy so that you have the vulnerability and safety to discuss sex to be naked, to to mess up, to share your fears. Because a lot of couples can't even communicate about their fears. They'll just sort Mm. of put on the boxing gloves and get into the cage, if you will, and and start going at it without realizing, you know, all the fears that are driving the the boxing match or driving Mm. the quarrel or underneath. And that's what that's where we need to be speaking from. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of teaching couples that emotional piece, but the other piece to really teach them is divorcing out of codependence. And codependence is very elusive and subtle, but a lot of couples will play hot potato with their emotions and be hypervigilant of the other person's mood. So they'll be like, oh, she just walked into the room. You know, they're like cracking body language, mood, everything. And then there's a reaction. Now I have to change who I am and I get anxious based on what I see and vice versa. Oh, they're getting anxious. Now I'm anxious and I have to withhold. Mm. where I have to do something different. And so it's a very subtle, elusive codependence, but teaching couples to hold on to their own energy and their own mood. And the idea is you do you, they do them, right? Got it. And so what you're d- trying to do is interdependence versus codependence. 
And talk to me a little bit about that in, in, intradependence. Is that what you call it? You're, in, you're interdependent. You're, interdependent. You care about the other person, yes. right? There, there, there's, a, there's a care and a curiosity of the other person, but there's not a hypervigilance. Uh-huh. Okay. And that's the difference, right? It's a subtle move. I mean, couples who are very, very codependent with like alcohol issues, that's very obvious. But I'm talking about the subtle, elusive codependence that most of us get into and that is an important piece to say, okay, I'm curious about your mood. I care about you. I can offer compassion, but I don't have to lose myself and absorb your anxiety. So when we get hypervigilant, right. we absorb their anxiety. Okay. So on this emotional level is really developing that autonomy, that sort of emotional autonomy of like, I'm good the way I am. I'm mm -hmm. confident. I'm calm. I'm curious. Partner is confident, calm, and curious. And from there, anything is possible, we can grow. From there, we have a lot of space, right? If we don't have codependence, we have a lot of space in the relationship, even if we have a 700 square foot studio that we're living in together. Right, right. right? and sh sharing a lot of space, <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, and then from there, you develop physical intimacy. How do we be regulating our own nervous system? then mm -hmm. sensual, and then sexual. So that's sort of the general premise of the roadmap. Got it. So you've told me and ex you've explained to us about interdependence, but not codependence. Tell us or describe for us, what does codependence look like so that we can recognize it in our own relationships? You recognize it as hypervigilance, right? You're not, when, when your partner walks in the room and something's a little off, are you calm? And you're like, oh, I'm kind of curious about you. Are you, you seem a little off. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Right, that's a really different energy than. Right, there's a subtle like, oh, I'm a little hyper vigilant. Oh, are you okay? Oh, I'm a little nervous. So it's really being able to track your own anxiety. Mm. And look, anxiety is normal for humans. We're not at the top of the food chain for no reason at all. I think anxiety <laughs> is a very important evolutionary tactic. There's a saber tooth tiger. I'm going to be anxious, but when it gets too much, when we get too hyper vigilant of our surroundings, especially our spouse or partner's surroundings, mm -hmm. then we get into trouble because then we lose ourselves. I've just abandoned myself to track you. Right. So, um, so I, I may be interpreting or, or more likely misinterpreting whatever that look was on your face. Correct. Okay. Right. And we make up a worse story than the truth usually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so, so some of the ways out of this are what, give me the steps out of doing that. It's really staying grounded in your own nervous system, mm -hmm. finding your center, your sense of self, staying present in that, noticing when you shift out of it into hypervigilance and coming back, calibrating into yourself so that you can approach your partner with curiosity versus hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. Like, are you okay? Your mood seems a little off is really different than are you okay? Right. You're off. Right. Do you right. notice the subtle, I'm, I'm being a little overdramatic with it, but that subtle difference really throws couples into a tailspin. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, um, let's say because you're, you know, you're jammed together too, too long in the same space. Um, perhaps you've had an argument or a disagreement and then there's this hypervigilance. I mean, how, do, if you've had a disagreement or it's an argument with your significant other or spouse, um, how do you, you know, how do you disengage from that so that you don't, you know, you don't become codependent and reading yeah. every little eye glance or every little frown? Sure. When you know, so, I guess my question is when you know there's a precedent for this, there's been an argument or a disagreement, how do you disengage from that so that you don't start misinterpreting the follow-up? Timeouts. I'm a big fan of timeouts. So when we say to our partner, hold on, I need a little space. I need five minutes. I need 20 minutes, whatever you think you need. I need to come back and feel grounded and back in balance, right? Mm -hmm. I'm noticing I am totally off or time out. We, right. If you notice your partner is really out of sorts, but you don't want to tell them you are out of sorts. Cause that can feel like an attack. Yes. Just use the, we thing. We seem a little out of sorts here. We are not having productive compassionate conversation, right? Let's take a time out, get calm, get centered, get collected and come back. I use a lot of different theories. So there's Dan Tacken's work, there's Sue Johnson's work and honestly, Dan Siegel's work that I use with my kids, I use with adults. So if you're familiar with like flip your lid and we 
lost, you know, kids will flip their lid and have a temper tantrum. And the idea is to help them regulate and come back into their center to put their lid back on. So they're thinking with their prefrontal cortex and not their emotional, mm. you know, back of the brainstem, although mm-hmm. they're kids. So depending on their age, I say that to couples too. take the time out to feel like your lid comes back on. Because if you feel like your lid is up, if you feel like you're operating from the back of your brainstem very emotionally without being able to stay grounded and balanced, you're not going to get anywhere in a conversation. You're just going to throw your feelings around and those are important, but they're, they're not, um, they're not facts, right? What, what we're trying to do is really get to the root of our fears mm-hmm. and share from that place so that we can, you know, next step is find what do we need, right? What do eat, what does each person need? And then how do we find the overlap and the compromise? You also described something I wanted to ask about. You described the prefrontal cortex versus the, the brainstem. Is this something that you can experience and feel? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, there, there's, there's sort of, (laughs) it's funny. There's the emotion, the mammal brain and the reptilian brain. And it's, it's sort of, these are metaphors, if you will, Jonathan, for our reactions. So our prefrontal cortex is literally what makes us human. And it's our ability to have logic and reason. Mm -hmm. And so these other parts of our brain that are more reactionary or emotional are super important and valid in terms of being able to respond and react to the world around us, whether it's humans or the natural world. Right. But if we're reacting to our spouse as if they are a saber toothed tiger when they're not, Mm -hmm. then our reaction is going to be overblown. Hmm. So that is what I mean in terms of noticing your reactions. You know, are they young? Are you, are you operating and behaving from a place up here that seems more logical or are you having a reaction that's okay? Have the reaction, right? We're human, have the mm-hmm. reaction, but then we want to come back into balance and use our prefrontal cortex to help us communicate through the issue. Uh, we don't want to just communicate with the react, the reactionary part of ourselves. Right. So as you're saying, the reactionary part of ourselves is it keeps us safe, I guess. Yeah, it's Away important. From danger. And that's a yeah, that's a very important totally. function to have, but but you don't want to, you really want to assess, is this really a dangerous situation? And do I need to run or fight? Um, or should I come out of that, you know, protective stance and go more into my frontal cortex, my logical cort- my logical part of my brain to see how, what's happening here? It's a blend of both. It's honoring and listening to all parts of that brain, right? Uh-huh. That's what the timeout can be. Oh, there's that reactionary part. Let me hear what that has to say. It might have utility or it might think, this scenario is 40 years old and it's just having an, you know, an automatic autopilot response because it's used to being abandoned right. or it's used to being told you're worthless, right? That's how we react. We, we usually react from a very young place. My partner's going to leave or they're going to tell me I'm worthless. Those mm-hmm. are our two main core wounds. So that's the reaction we usually have when the partner is usually just trying to say, I just, I just need you to help out the dishes, but I'm not telling you you're worthless. I'm not getting divorced. <laughs> I just need some help with the dishes. Right. <laughs> it might not be as simple as that, but it could be a simple fight like that. Yeah. But we hear it as if you don't do the dishes, I will leave. Or if you don't do the dishes, I, you know, you are worthless. Got it. So it's okay. hearing the reactionary part, softening that self-soothing that bringing your frontal cortex online so that you can then communicate with your partner around what needs to happen moving forward. Got it. So we're talking with Jenny Schuyler, PhD, LMFT, and CST. That's a certified sex therapist. We're talking about satisfying intimacy and sex for the long haul. And you can find Jenny Schuyler at the intimacyinstitute.org. She's also the um, in-house resident expert at Adam and Eve, America's largest sex toy company. We will be back with Dr. Jenny in just a moment after these messages. So stay tuned because we're going to be talking more about the how-to of long-term intimacy. Stay with us. Find out what's happening on the Voice America Talk Radio Network by keeping up with us on Twitter. You can find us at Voice America TRN. Listen for Go to Health Radio. 
featuring host Jonathan Marks and health experts from around the world who bring evidence-based education from Western, alternative, and holistic practices. We bring together you, seeking relevant and proven information for your health care needs and reputable health care experts and companies who offer quality education for your benefit. Monthly, we also share continuing education for medical professionals. Listen live every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Time and 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Variety. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. You are listening to Go to Health Radio. To reach Jonathan Marks or his guest expert on the live program, call in to 1-866-472-5788. That's 1-866-472-5788. You may also send an email to Jonathan Marks at gotohealthmedia.com. Now, back to this week's show. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking with Jenny Schuyler, PhD. We're talking about satisfying intimacy and sex for the long haul. This is Jonathan Marks with Go to Health Media. And so, Jenny, I wanted to have a further discussion about and really focus this time not on so much the, the intellectual or emotional intimacy, but more sexual in a, intimacy and how to keep that satisfying over the long haul. Because I know that couples can kind of get into a routine that can get boring. And how do you keep it alive? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. It's very unique to each couple. And what I mean by that is, if a couple has a really strong relationship, they have a lot of emotional intimacy, a lot of intellectual intimacy, maybe even a lot of social intimacy, they socialize happily with each other and others and have a bigger community. And all of those pieces are in play sex is not burdened with the only place that they have connection, Mm. which means that they have a little bit of, um, you know, sort of an ebb and flow or, or, um, a scarcity for a little bit. And I don't mean like a scarcity in terms of years and years, but if, if there's a little bit of a dry spell, if you will, Mm -hmm. then it's not the end of the world because they have all the other places of emotional connection to keep them unified and allow for the communication to go, yeah, it's a dry spell. We're really busy this summer. Or or, yeah, it's a dry spell. We're both really stressed, but let's try to come back together. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do try to emphasize these these other pieces of intimacy so that the couple has a more global, um, felt sense of intimacy on different in different realms so that it's not just sex that connects them. Mm -hmm. Now that said, if they're not having any sex or sex feels really scarce or feels really stale, we want to put sex under the microscope and see what's happening. For most couples, we abide by the sexual narrative that sex is really this transaction where we quickly take off our clothes, have a few pecks on the lip, and then, you know, hop to intercourse, usually penis, vagina intercourse, if you're a heterosexual or other kinds of, you know, more oral or anal play, if you're not a heterosexual couple. Mm -hmm. And most couples, irrelevant of your sexual orientation or gender, usually bypass the fun foreplay and the sensual intimacy needed for satisfying sexual intimacy. And the sensual intimacy is key. That's where all the fun energy is. That's where Mm -hmm. all the eroticism is. That's where some of the fantasies live. And sometimes couples just need to focus on that all month long. And then they have, you know, actual um, penetrative or oral sex once a month. I'd rather them have a big fat piggy bank of sensual intimacy Mm. and less sexual intimacy because it's actually in the sensual that we feel the depths of connection. And yet that is always missing from the sexual narrative. It's all about the transaction and getting to the goal of orgasm. Now, orgasm is great. Don't get me wrong, but that can happen in the sensual. Right. But it's the steps ahead of time. Well, so I'm just wondering how intercourse is not deep connection. I mean, is it just more physical and animal-like? or What's missing there? What's missing there that that makes the foreplay important? So... The, the foreplay is usually where are we checking in with each other? Are we tracking each other's bodies? 
-hmm. Are we building up enough arousal in both people to go to intercourse? Oftentimes the woman's arousal is bypassed or shortchanged because our arousal works really differently as men and women, right? Mm -hmm. It is through penetration that the, uh, 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 an erect penis moves from erection towards arousal, towards higher arousal, towards orgasm. Mm -hmm. It is only 25% of women who can have a lot of arousal built up through intercourse to have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. The other 75% need clitoral. So mm-hmm. my rule of thumb is build up the arousal in foreplay so that the woman is at a high level of arousal. Think like a seven on a scale of 10 mm-hmm. before you do penetration. So that because women don't typically, I'll say 75% of women don't typically build up their arousal via penetration. I so see. then what happens is if you have penetration too quickly, um, yes, it can feel very connecting, right? You are inside one another and there's an, an enveloping feeling. Um, but some women will go through the motions to check the box to get rid of their partner until the next time on their clock, it's, they're ready to go. So mm-hmm. that's a very transactional experience. Other I couples see. are, this is very inviting. This is, this is our place of connection and it's not penetration, but it's absorption, mm. which is a whole different concept. I'm absorbing the penis. I'm inviting it in. It's on my terms, right? The, the vaginal canal saying, I want you to enter me versus the penis goes it's my time to enter you mm. hmm. interesting S- subtle thing yeah 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 wow wow i'm just having lots of thoughts i don't have a question <laughs> <laughs> well share your thoughts jonathan yeah what happened for you as i say that i'm curious well it's, <laughs> it's just it, um yeah interesting that um the woman has takes more time now why is it that to take the woman takes more time to get aroused do we know Yeah, I think this is a a facet of testosterone. So testosterone is the sex drive hormone. It really is what gets us aroused. Mm -hmm. Think about it as a fireplace, right? So testosterone circulating through the male body, um, a a normal level, I mean, normal levels are honestly somewhere between 250, 300 up to, you know, a thousand in terms of testosterone numbers. But I like men, depending on their age, to be anywhere between four and 500 at the low end, in my opinion to mm-hmm. really have enough muscle mass, to have enough um, testosterone to offset depression and, and keep a good mood, right? So if their testosterone is too low, they can be prey to, to depression, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's just not good for the human psyche to have too low of testosterone. Now, you don't have too high either because, you know, you might be raging, but depending on your age and your fitness level, you might have higher numbers in the eight, nine hundreds. Right. Um, women have somewhere between four to 120 with an average around 60, right? Mm. So if you think about 60 versus 500, it's a radical difference Wow! in terms of testosterone flowing through the body. And, and there's different kinds of testosterone. Um, but, but for the sake of this, this conversation, if you just think very broadly about those, those basic numbers, um, arousal is like right here on your shoulder when you have a level of 500 right? Hello, I'm right here. I'm accessible. It means arousal is accessible. And all you got to do with the fireplace, like a gas fireplace is turn on the switch. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. My arousal is accessible. It's right here. Right. Versus if you're, if your testosterone level is 60, right? That's a big difference, right? Your arousal is somewhere in the woods. You got to go chop down the tree, mm-hmm. make some kindling, carry the wood back, build the fire light the fire now you have a fire right you have a wood fireplace that you have lit there's a lot more effort that goes into it so that's just the analogy i make in terms of building arousal when it's just less accessible it doesn't mean anything's wrong it just means we're built differently because testosterone flows through our bodies differently so when when the male gets aroused by testosterone what's happening in the female body during her arousal if she doesn't have as much um, testosterone is it is there more testosterone being produced and get flowing through her body as well or is there something else going on it's brain ah. women <laughs> okay <laughs> so our sex organ is our brain right? okay so testosterone is a piece of the puzzle when you talk about just so arousal is what turns on the body desire is what turns on the brain so mm. you can have a, a woman who has Lots of, as Emily Nagowski says, accelerators, lots of things that fuel her sex drive. Well, that's not clinical, the word sex drive, but fuel her desire so that she's excited about sex so that it accesses her 
testosterone. Mm. But the testosterone is not the driving force, right? Mm. It just isn't in terms of the biology of how we're made up. Mm -hmm. Now, you can have a man with a level of 900 testosterone, and he has Madonna whore syndrome in his brain, and he has no desire to have sex with his spouse because he has Madonna whore, right? He might have desire to have sex with others out there, but, and Madonna whore, by the way, is a terrible um, clinical term, but it is what we use out there. And what's it, the what's it called it. again? Can you say that? Madonna whore. Madonna so there's a whore. schism in okay. the brain of like, my, my partner is the Madonna. I respect her. I she is the mother of my children, or she is the respected woman I decided to marry. And I do not have sex with her Got it. because she's a Madonna. Got it. Okay, and then good. anybody else, fair game. Um, so you can have a high level of testosterone, but the brain can drive your <laughs> sexuality towards mm -hmm. whatever population you desire. Mm -hmm. So the brain is super powerful. It's what creates our fantasies, our eroticism, and what can give us that extra fuel. But we also have to have permission to access our desire in our brain. Again, we come back to the sexual narrative. Most of us grow up in some sort of rigidity, whether it's society, whether it's religion, and it goes, oh, desire is dangerous, mm -hmm. right? Pleasure is dangerous. Arousal is dangerous. So then we hit puberty, we feel it percolating up, and we go, oh, dangerous, push that down. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in adulthood is the first moments it comes rising up, our imprint is to push it down. We don't even realize we're pushing it down sometimes, Jonathan. It just happens. Right. Got it. So really, so for women, it, it, the brain is really important and the fantasy and, and the, it, it, I guess, getting aroused that way. Yes. I mean, I, I think I've known this, but it's wonderful hearing, <laughs> hearing a more clinical explanation of all this. And I really appreciate yeah. your being here and sharing this with us. So Jenny, let me the, ask. The body is important too, Jonathan, which is why you take the extra time for touch and foreplay. Uh-huh. Okay. That's, that's why that was the original question. Yes, Body and brain both matter. They're one connected system, but there's the brain is going to be the fuel and mm -hmm. the body needs extra love and being extra cherished. So Jenny, what got you into this line of work? What interested you? What motivated you? Oh, that's a good semi-complicated question. Um, my dad was a, a medical doctor, is a medical doctor. He's still alive. And so he took an approach to teaching me the world through the lens of medicine and everything was sort of a, a medical clinical issue. So it doesn't really matter what the subject matter was. It's going to be thorough. It's going to be clinical. It's going to be research validated. Mm -hmm. So as, as an, you know, it didn't, it didn't matter what it was. Sex was one of those topics. I got books, I got videos in terms of, you know, there's a, a sex video in terms of it was age appropriate but mm -hmm. it was like this is how babies are made right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so it was never a taboo subject isn't the point because it was always sort of this it was a medical subject but it was never taboo and then you fast forward into time and my friends would come over they'd read the books i had they'd read the books he had in the bookshelf and i sort of became the go-to resource for all my friends sort of like mm. the Dr. Ruth of, of, of friends. I never Dr. thought much of it. It was just sort of a fun thing. Everyone sort of knew Jenny likes to talk about sex. She's comfortable with it. She kind of pushes the edge. Um, I'm sort of a fun, passionate, fiery person. So, you know, it was just easy to talk about and easy to be inside that world. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to college, I was in the vagina monologues, which is Eve mm -hmm. Ensler's yes. play on all things vulva. And at the time that I was in college, the colleges did a production of it. All colleges could buy her manuscript and, and, and do a production. And at that time, you could also write your own monologue mm. and you were allowed two or three monologues in the play. And what I noticed that was missing was pleasure. It was all about women and their vaginas and their vulvas and hair and trauma and, and evolution of, of, of their humanity, but there wasn't anything about female pleasure. So I wrote a monologue on female pleasure. And after that, I graduated from college and I realized, wait a minute, where is the conversation on pleasure? Now there's a ton of conversation on pleasure. Um, but at that time, when I wrote the monologue, the last line of my monologue was pleasure is our birthright. Hmm. Now people wow. have taken that that line and maybe it's, you know, used a lot somewhere else. But 21 years ago, I used that in my monologue and that was the driving force towards how do I help people with their sexuality? Because mm -hmm. this is an area that's um, just needs a lot more support. So you've really been doing this for a long time. Yeah, kind of, right? Not, not in a career sense, sort of mm -hmm. 
<laughs> armchair in high school with friends and then a little more armchair in college and mm-hmm. then after college really focused on a actual grad school path towards doing this in reality. So let's talk a little bit about when somebody comes to you or a couple comes to you for therapy. What's the process you go through with them? First, I chat on the phone. I do a complimentary chat just to make sure I'm the right person for them mm-hmm. because sometimes I'm not. I also try to, I, I, I'm tight on space. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of a wait list. So making sure that they're okay with the wait list, making sure that uh, they're okay with telehealth. And, you know, making sure that I'm the right person versus maybe my husband. My husband does a lot of great work with couples. So if a man shows up in a heterosexual relationship with a lower desire than his female partner, for instance, Daniel is great with working with men on that because Mm -hmm. it's really unblocking what's happening mentally and intellectually and psychologically um, in terms of their sexuality towards their spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, if there's men who are struggling with their masculinity and coming into their power, right? They're a little bit more um, seated in their people pleaser, right? And they feel like they're sort of getting walked all over. Mm. How do they come into their empowered sense of self so that the relationship feels more stable and and um, more of that yin-yang balance, if you will? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I tend to work with couples, you know, I have a lot of painful intercourse, for instance, I have a lot of affairs, healing from affairs. So I just sort of get a lay of the land of what people are really looking to explore. And then I figure out who's best. And we talk about confidentiality. I start slow. I just get to know you. We don't dive right into sex. Sometimes that's too aggressive and and feels a little too mm, invasive, if you will. So Mm -hmm. I get to know you and then we drop in. Then we Mm -hmm. drop in. What do you, what, what brings you? Right. Yes. What are the thing where, and then I always ask, where do you want to go? If I could wave my magic wand and take you somewhere, you know, where do you want to go? Got Paint it. me a picture of your relationship, emotionally, sexually, intellectually, financially, logistically, just paint for me a relationship of where you want to go. Because all of those pieces matter. If we just take sex out and put it under the microscope, we're missing all the other pieces that support their sexual life. Mm-hmm. So it really is again, like a holistic approach to a relationship. Absolutely. It has to be. Yes, of course. And um, are, I just I just have to ask, are you a sexual surrogate? No. Okay. And tell <laughs> me, <laughs> and explain what a sexual surrogate is and what's, what's the latest on that? Are they in vogue? Is it acceptable? Is it helpful? Is it curative or not? Okay. So, so sexology is the study of human sexuality. And there's a lot of different career fields you can have as a sexologist. Right. So you can be a therapist, which is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, I do not touch my clients. Mm-hmm. Um, I, there's no nudity. It's, it's basic psychotherapy in the office, having talk therapy. Mm-hmm. Now I'll make couples stand up and do exercises. I absolutely will have them practice how to walk up to their partner with confidence, right? Op- sometimes just approaching their partner in the kitchen tentatively you're, there's no sex going to happen after that. It's too tentative, right? So mm-hmm. I'll have them practice. I'll send them home with a lot of practice exercises. I'll send them home with a lot of behavioral homework. Um, but there's no touching. There's no nudity in my office because it's I'm a licensed therapist. Mm-hmm. Now, some people are educators and it's all education. Um, and they tend to write books or do workshops or um, teach in some format, maybe in a university. Mm-hmm. Some sexologists are journalists, right? You'll see that, you know, in different media outlets. And then some sex, uh, some are coaches, coaches, sex coaches have more flexibility to touch their clients and be a little more fluid with being in the bedroom with their clients because they're not, um, they don't have a license in the Mm -hmm. same way with their state, right? So the state of Colorado, I have a license as a therapist. And so there's certain ethical parameters I have to abide by. Coaches don't have to abide by any of that. So they can Mm -hmm. have more flexibility. For the client or the couple that wants that flexibility and wants a little bit more, you know, um, hands-on help literally in the bedroom, a coach might be the right person for them. Um, And a sexual surrogate is very hands-on. Now, if you're a true sexual surrogate with IPSA, which is the international, um, gosh, what's the P for? There's a P there, IPSA, Surrogate Association, I'm blanking mm-hmm. on what the P stands for, but they work with sex therapists. So I have worked with sex surrogates with clients who have either significant disabilities 
um, mm. or are working on intimacy much later in life and they can't find partners. And so the surrogate is a surrogate partner. Mm -hmm. It helps that client walk through the steps of intimacy and sexuality in a very safe way in a triangulated connection with the therapist so that the client is working with the therapist and working with the surrogate. So it's really clean and ethical mm -hmm. and, they, and it's different times, right? I'll have the client for a session and then the surrogate will set up their own session somewhere else. And so the surrogate really helps that client build up um, their confidence in terms of intimacy if there's no other ability to have a partner. Mm -hmm. So that's what a sexual surrogate is. Got it. Okay, great. And they're very I, important for people like that. Yeah, good. Uh, no, I, I appreciate your answering that um, so clearly and uh, honestly, that's great. So we're talking with Dr. Jenny Schuyler, PhD. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's also a certified sex therapist. She's the founder of the Intimacy Institute at the intimacyinstitute.org. And she's also the resident expert at Adam and Eve, America's largest sex toy company at adameve.com. We'll be right back with our final session with Dr. Schuyler after these messages. Stay with us. We'll be right back. what's happening on the Voice America Talk Radio Network by keeping up with us on Twitter. You can find us at Voice America TRN. Listen for Go to Health Radio, featuring host Jonathan Marks and health experts from around the world who bring evidence-based education from Western, alternative, and holistic practices. We bring together you, seeking relevant and proven information for your health care needs and reputable health care experts and companies who offer quality education for your benefit. Monthly, we also share continuing education for medical professionals. Listen live every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Time and 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Variety. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. You are listening to Go to Health Radio. To reach Jonathan Marks or his guest expert on the live program, call in to 1-866-472-5788. That's 1-866-472-5788. You may also send an email to Jonathan Marks at gotohealthmedia.com. Now, back to this week's show. This is Jonathan Marks with Go to Health, and we are talking with Jenny Schuyler, PhD. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's a certified sex therapist and a board-certified sexologist along with doing marriage and family counseling. And she sees people virtually throughout the United States. She's also the director of the Intimacy Institute for Sex and Relationship Therapy for the past 12 years. That's at the intimacyinstitute.org. And she's also the resident expert at Adam and Eve, America's largest sex toy company at adameve.com. So Jenny, tell us more. I know you, you see people virtually, but you also have a number of courses that you have online already and you're developing more. Tell us about the content that you have. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, when COVID hit, we decided to put a lot of our material that we had face-to-face -face, like couples retreats online mm -hmm. so that people would have access to it. And so our, our main course for couples is literally called Roadmap to Intimacy. It's our program that we take couples through, whether they're in our office as a couple, just one-on-one, -on -one, or whether they're in a couple's retreat with us. And so it's a three and a half hour course with lots of breakout sessions, lots of homework, but it's the whole didactic material of how to walk through all the segments and components you need for a successful relationship. So that's course one. My husband just made two more courses, one on solving premature ejaculation and one on solving erectile dysfunction. We literally just finished editing those and they're gonna be up on the website here very soon. So we're excited to launch those. Great. And down, coming down the pipeline are just more courses. We're gonna give a lot more courses. We might have some live courses for people that sort of master course where we teach material, but then you get to have us live teaching you and doing a breakout session um, in the middle of the course if you volunteer. Mm -hmm. 
And you can find all these courses at your website, which is the intimacyinstitute.org. Yes. Got it. And when you talk about these courses that you've got up now, are these mostly self-guided or are they somehow interspersed with sessions with you or group sessions? Right now they're self-guided. So you just buy the video course and then you can do it at your pace mm -hmm. and rewind and fast forward and all of that. Right. Um, again, coming down the pipeline, we're going to be offering a bigger virtual portal where we will be involved in the courses. So you can do the course um online with us mm -hmm. and we'll be teaching the course and then also offering some sessions mid-course to help couples sort of touch in and get some live help got it great that sounds very exciting um and tell us about your work at adam and eve where you are the resident expert yeah adam and eve is um a sex toy company and they offer lots of products they're great they have products for every person on this planet. So it doesn't matter what your genitals look like. Um, you can find a toy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you can find toys beyond that. There's toys for all other parts of the body. There's toys if you want to get into bondage. There's toys for couples looking just to um, play some board games or dice games. Mm -hmm. um, there's some furniture even. So like the wedge that helps sort of prop people up. Um, it's also helpful if you don't have full capacity of your body, if you have some sort of, um, you know, challenge in your body, some of the furniture can be really helpful. Right. Um, and some stuff is just really sexy. Some of the clothes are just really sexy. So the website is really great. You know, the company is really great. They're based out of North, North Carolina. Most of the people who work there have been there for decades. They're mm. very committed to it. It really is impressive. Mm -hmm. the community feel of Adam and Eve, even though it's a really big company. Mm -hmm. um, and my role is just the sexual health, expert. So what I do is I answer a lot of questions for the media when media reaches out to Adam and Eve and they have mm -hmm. a sexual health question mm -hmm. or a sexual therapy question. I answer the question or I'll write the article. Um, the other thing I do is I make a lot of videos for them. They're called Savvy Sex in 60 Seconds. Oh, great. They're little, they're really 120 seconds, to be honest. They're about two minutes. Uh -huh. Sometimes they're a minute, um, but they're a minute to two minutes of a piece of information on a particular topic. It's quick, it's easy, it's it's accessible, and you just get to easily digest that piece of sexual health information or relationship information, and off you go. Right. So visiting that website, so I can imagine a lot of people might feel kind of squeamish or um, whatever I want to say, in insecure or uncertain or nervous. I mean, you're talking about it very naturally, like this is a sex toy company, it can be a lot of fun. Tell us how people can get into a more healthy attitude about considering sex toys. Well, one is that being online, you get to be anonymous. So I think shopping online is sometimes far easier than in person. Mm -hmm. um, I used to assign homework to couples go into a physical store just to see how you feel to mm -hmm. get over that sort of embarrassment of being in a store but online is very safe and very anonymous and I always think that having a toy by your bedside as a best friend as as a backup as a participant is so key and even if it's just what you buy is lube that's also key because I think all couples need extra lube as a just in case like why not mm -hmm. or body oil right mm -hmm. let's touch the whole body you might as well put some oil on your body mm -hmm. um so the toy is an accessory to support and supplement our eroticism and our sexuality um it's a great facet if you want just self-pleasure i think solo sex is so key not a lot of people talk about it but solo sex is huge in terms of just being in touch with your own sexuality mm -hmm. knowing what you like knowing how you work knowing what turns you on. And I think the lowest stress sex that is possible once we get comfortable with it is mutual masturbation or side-by-side -side solo sex. Mm. Mm. And side-by-side -side solo sex, you know how to get yourself off. Your partner usually knows how to get themselves off. You're there together as intimate and connected, but there's not a lot of stress built into it. It's sort of a, yeah, you check the box of finding your orgasm pretty easily, but it's a way to just like not have to do a long experience, but still feel connected, still share arousal, still share an experience of orgasm. And a lot of people need a toy for that. Mm -hmm. So this is really can be a mature way of looking at your own body and, and playing with your body and other people's bodies. 
Yeah, of course. Tell me, talk to me about masturbation. And just when I say that word, it feels like I'm saying a taboo word. You called it something else, self-sex? I called it solo sex. So, solo or, sex, okay. Or so, self-pleasure. Okay, good. So let's let's talk about that. Is that a is that healthy? Is it okay? Does it get in the way of uh, you know sex between people? I'm a big fan of masturbation. I do like to call it solo sex or self pleasure because masturbation does have a cultural connotation of you know there's something in our system that says yuck, but it also means to defile with one's hand. There's no defiling, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's giving yourself pleasure. Mm-hmm. And just the way you are in relationship with yourself, with your nervous system, with your activities, with your hobbies, with your career, with your passion, why should you not be in relationship with yourself, with your sexuality? Mm-hmm. So I think it's really key to be in a relationship with yourself, know how your body works, know how your fantasies work, right? It's not just I'm touching my genitals or putting a toy to my genitals. It's what do I like to watch? What do I like to imagine? Where does my brain go, right? Mm-hmm. That's a key piece of our sexuality that happens really easily when we are alone and it's when we're alone we get to be in relationship with that it's also when we're alone that we get to practice if we're trying to last longer right Mm -hmm. if we're trying to find out what really turns us on if it feels more elusive if we're trying to give ourselves permission for arousal so solo sex is super important for that it's also important if there's a desire discrepancy in the relationship if one person wants more sex than the other great solo sex fills in the blanks it's it's Mm. huge Got right. It. Rather okay. than burden the partner with being the only place where they can have an orgasm, mm-hmm. that's completely unfair. And you're actually going to drive your partner further away and end up in a f- terrible, terrible spot. Mm-hmm. You need to take responsibility for your own orgasms. Mm. I'll say the, the couples that come in that are re- that refuse to masturbate or refuse to engage in solo sex and burden their partner with being the sole source of all their orgasms mm. and they have a high sex drive those partnerships end up almost inevitably in divorce. They Uh, have to be able to take responsibility for their orgasm and fill in the gaps by themselves and not be resentful that the other person has a lower sex drive. This is so helpful. This is, this is great. And um, talk to me too about porn. What's your, what's your thought about porn is, does that help? Does that get in the way of sex? So both, it depends again on the person. So Mm -hmm. porn for a person who who wants to just use it as arousing material to turn on their brain or arousing material for the couple. Sometimes couples like to watch it Mm -hmm. together. You know, if you use it as fantasy material and realize it's not, you know, that's not what genitals actually look like. That's not usually what sex really looks like unless it's, there's a whole category called ethical porn. And usually it's real people having real sex and there's more sensuality. um, There's more, um, build up an anticipation and romance, you know, we don't just jump quickly to the genital action. Um, right. when people watch porn, they misinterpret that sex jumps quickly to the genital action and they miss all the other components. Mm-hmm. So if you understand what porn is and use it as erotic material, just to turn your brain on for arousing y- y- use, great. But I think it's really important to be able to also imagine your fantasies, right? So it's sort of like, yeah, I like to have hamburgers sometimes, but steak dinner is good as well. Mm-hmm. So diversifying how you're able to turn yourself on and also checking yourself, right? If if you use porn exclusively and you're not able to get de- turned on by your partner, it's probably time to take a sabbatical from porn. Mm-hmm. Also, it's not great sex education for our, our youth, but that's a whole other can of worms to navigate. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, the average age that kids are seeing porn is 11. And sometimes as young as eight, I've had phone calls from parents who are like, my eight-year-old saw porn. What do we do now? Right? Mm -hmm. It's complicated because they're seeing imagery of of sexuality that's not real and they're and it's not age appropriate for them. So it's not to say that it's it's the porn is bad. It's just the age of exposure is inappropriate and then build images in their brain around what is a relationship supposed to look like? What is sex supposed to look like? What am I supposed to look like naked? Right. right. And then depending on the porn, it could be very graphic. It can be kind of scary for some kids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, some porn out there is, is dramatic. So I, I'm not um, against it, but I'm also not a, the biggest champion for it. I think I sit pretty much in the middle, depending on the consumer. Um, and depending on the relationship to porn. So I think it's really about your relationship to porn, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if the child sees it's once it's unfortunate, but as long as they don't keep coming back, 
and keep using it, um, we're going to be okay, right? If they see it and then the parents have no boundaries and then there's constant access to it from an early age, even pre-puberty, there's going to be a huge problem on their hands in terms of later down the line, uh, most likely struggle to get aroused with it, a real human. Mm -hmm. be because? Because their brain is now, in, the imprint, if you think about the first time, let me do it this way, Jonathan, think about the first time you had solo sex, mm -hmm. right? Is either probably some picture you found in some magazine, maybe it was a romantic movie on, on the screen, um, maybe it was, uh, you know, a fantasy about somebody in your classroom, right? You know, at, at our ages, we didn't have porn in the same way accessible because moving erotica on the internet wasn't available right. at the time we were coming into our solo sex practice. And so there was an ability to develop an imagination and an eroticism mm -hmm. and scale into our sexuality, be turned on by other other kids in the classroom, for instance, right. um, if you're, for instance, if you're in high school and you're walking down the hallway, you're like, oh, you know, I'm excited by that person versus like, no one does it for me. I just want to go home and turn my screen on. Mm -hmm. And my screen has very exciting action that nothing can compare to, right? My screen has a lot of stimulation going on. You know, think about an action movie made in the eighties versus now, mm -hmm. right? Even just like Top Gun, right? Top Gun in the 80s versus Top Gun now. Like it's it's a it's a dramatic film. Like the ability for filmography to really make it powerful and stimulating and action and bombard all our senses. Right. It, it, you can't you can't compare with that. All right. So that's that's the subtle issue with this, right? That's why I say if your relationship to porn is, oh, it turns me on, but I can also have fantasy, you're in good shape. Good. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jenny, we're really at the end of our time. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I've learned so much and I hope our audience is learning a lot as well. You've really made this all feel very natural and um, you know, not dirty and we can really have a healthy relationship with our partners, with our own bodies, with sex, with, and not only with physical sex, but also intimacy. And I really appreciate all your explanations and um, answering my questions. You've really answered a lot of them for me. Thank you. My pleasure, Donovan. You, you, you covered the whole terrain. I mean, you even went into the screen, relationship with the screen. I mean, you, you covered so much. So thanks for all the very intelligent questions. Good. Yes. Thank you. So we're talking with Jenny Schuyler. She's PhD. She's also a, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she's a certified sex therapist. She and her husband run the Intimacy Institute at theintimacyinstitute.org. And she's also the resident expert at Adam and Eve, which is America's largest sex toy company. And you can find them at adameve.com. And they have been a sponsor for today's show. Thank you so much again, Jenny. It's been a delight getting to know you and having you on the show. Same, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. All right, folks. So as we say every week, as we end the show, and we will see you next week with another one, go to health. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in this week to Go to Health Radio. Be sure to join Jonathan Marks and another health expert next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time and 12 noon Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. You can also catch the program on your favorite podcast platform. Until our next show, be sure to visit us on the web at gotohealthmedia.com and elevate your life.